can hear me. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much to all of you who are here today who have joined us for this special evening. Uh, I want to also take the opportunity to thank the Conduit and the team for all your support for this wonderful partnership. This is our second event in collaboration with the Conduit. And of course, my special thanks to the Blue Marine Foundation for collaborating with us to host this event. They are a wonderful organization. I invite all of you to stay afterwards. We're gonna have drinks, meet the speakers, and also I believe there are a few books there, also written, uh, written by Charles Clover, and I highly recommend you can get the books from the Blue Marine Foundation. Uh, just a brief introduction. We have lots to cover today. Uh, my name is Katia Dalpoz, and I am the founder of One Million Voices. There you go. <laughs> And it's a project that I started during the pandemic, as many of us did, start new things, we tried new things during those bleak times and very strange, to say the least, times where the whole world was experiencing more or less the same thing. Um, and the idea initially was just to start a community, of course, back then, online, you could do only things online, uh, where I would invite experts, leading voices, to share their stories, their insights, their knowledge, and have a very honest conversation about all the ups and downs, things that don't go according to plan. And initially, that was the idea. So I spoke with uh, loads of interesting people. We did a series of interviews we launched online on our YouTube channel. And we have uh, people from all sorts of different backgrounds, from a war correspondent to a royal photographer, to a musician, artist, leading business people, entrepreneurs who are real trailblazers and have transformed an entire industry. Um, and another part of the idea was to, I would always invite our guests to nominate an organization, a charity that is making a difference in the world. And the idea was to champion those unsung heroes. And because we just want to also, I think, feel positive and to give, have a sense of hope. Back then, that was very necessary during the pandemic, and it still is. You just have to open the newspapers. So if you connect with the speakers and the charities, even if it's just to follow them, like the Blue Marine Foundation, for example, you will be inspired, hopefully, and you connect to a cause that is close to your heart. Probably you're here today because of that. And you learn from work that is being done around the world. Another thing that is being happening as well, when people watch our interviews, they usually say, oh, it was really refreshing to see this leading voice, very successful person, describing a problem they went through. And it's very similar to what I'm going. So that's this connection, also universal connection that we are building. So we're trying to build a community. Now, this year, we started hosting this in-person event. Uh, this is our third event. We have another one next week, and we have much more coming up next year as well. And we are going to still do things online as well, because not everybody can show up in person. Uh, so I would like to invite you to join us. Uh, we have some bookmarks and some leaflets as well. There's a QR code you can see here behind me. If you go to the QR code, it will take us to a very simple landing page where you can leave your email address and your name. Please don't worry, we are not gonna bombard you with newsletters and marketing materials and tons of messages. This is just to stay in touch and to send you invitations for uh, our upcoming events like this and to let you know also when there's new content online. That's just it. And if you can follow also us on social media, we are on Instagram, Facebook X, and of course YouTube that I just mentioned. If you can subscribe, it makes all the difference. Now, of course, without further ado, the moment we have all been waiting for, it's my honor to introduce our guests today. We have a panel of experts which are absolutely brilliant. And I'm sorry for that, but I forgot my iPad, which always happens when you are in a hurry. So I have to work with my mobile phone. <laughs> but um, I would love to introduce you and it's an honor to welcome our guests. And my, the first guest that I would like to introduce today is Claire Brook. She's the CEO of Blue Marine Foundation. She joined Blue Marine in 2014 as Chief Finance Officer and then became Chief Executive in 2015. Prior to joining Blue Marine, she worked for 24 years in environmental finance, managing the UK's first green investment funds at Jupiter, 
then at NPI and Henderson. She set up Aviva's Sustainable Investment Division and co-founded WHEB Asset Management. So please, Claire, if you could join us. Thank you. I'm also going to invite to the stage before we invite Claire to, for a quick presentation. We also have Tom Hickey today. Tom is project director, coastal wetlands at the Pew Charitable Trusts. He supports Pew's Protecting Coastal, coastal Wetlands and Coral Reefs project and is responsible for leading engagement with a range of stakeholders, including international institutions such as the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Hickey previously led Pew's government relation work in the United Kingdom, and his previous roles included public affairs manager at the Marine Conservation Society and as a consultant with MHP Communications. So, thank you for joining us. And it is also my pleasure to introduce Puninda Thind. Puninda is finance nature lead with the UN Climate Champions Team, focused on catalyzing and mobilizing finance sector action to address biodiversity loss and nature-related risks and opportunities. She has contributed as a working group member to the UNFCCC Race to Zero Criteria consultation process. She is also active in climate advocacy as a member of the Global Shapers Community, an initiative of the World Economic Forum. Puninda has been recognized as one of Canada's top 30 under 30 sustainability leaders and one of Canada's top 25 under 25 environmentalists and as a Clean 50 honoree for her contribution to the advancement of climate action. Puninda. I mean, this is a real panel of experts. And before we open the conversation, I would like to invite Claire for a brief introduction, because as we all know, COP is just around the corner. And there are loads of things to be considered as we think about the issues that are going to be discussed at COP. And Claire has prepared a beautiful presentation for us. I'm just going to give her this little thing here to help. <laughs> so over to you, Claire. Thanks so much, Katia, and um, thanks for the lovely welcome. Thank you so much to everyone for coming this evening. And thanks particularly to Tom and Peninda, who are actually experts. Um, I'm just a generalist who can't use the technology. <laughs> oh, all right, there we Yay. are. <laughs> um, so in, in the run-up to uh, COP28, next month, um, why should we particularly focus on the ocean? Um, well, because the ocean is one of our biggest allies in warding off catastrophic climate change. Um, but it can only perform this vital role by dint of the life within it. And unfortunately, we are currently stripping the ocean of life. So to help the ocean help us, we need serious advances, particularly in three areas, as far as I see it, in science, in policy, and in economics. So Tom and Peninda will cover those, uh, two of those areas in particular much more. But just to look at a few kind of headline stats around the science. So um, blue carbon, as in how much carbon the ocean actually absorbs and stores is still a, a bit of an unanswered question. It's still in its infancy compared with our understanding of terrestrial carbon. But what do we know? Well, we know that the, absor the ocean has absorbed more than 90% of the excess heat we've produced. We know that it produces around half the oxygen we breathe and absorbs maybe between a quarter and half of our CO2, depending on whose figures you, um, you go with. And uh, we know that coastal ecosystems, uh, for example, particularly mangroves, seagrass, and salt marsh, are phenomenal carbon absorbers, um, far faster and more effective than terrestrial forests. And we also know that 
fish themselves uh, form something extraordinary called the biological carbon pump, which is the biggest migration on the planet, takes place every night um, when the uh, fish in the sea eat the tiny phytoplankton on the surface and uh, carry those, shuttle those down from the surface of the ocean to the, uh, to the ocean floor. And um, this, this works in all sorts of wonderful ways, which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit more when I come on to one of the projects that we're involved with. But um, certainly Greenpeace have estimated that without this biological carbon pump, atmospheric concentrations of CO2, which are the dreaded parts per million that we've seen going up and up since the Industrial Revolution that you know, scare us all silly when we look at those stats. But without the ocean performing the biological carbon pump, uh, atmospheric concentrations of CO2 would be 50% higher. So it's pretty vital that we uh, look after the life within the ocean. So uh, sadly, we are not. And this is a, a glimpse from space, from a satellite, of what the Atlantic Ocean looks like in terms of fishing effort. And um, in a strange and kind of classically human being self-defeating move, we are basically stripping the oceans of the very life that supports us through this kind of industrial scale plunder, plunder that is uh, overfishing. And so every, everywhere that you can see sort of vaguely lit up is representing a huge fish, fishing vessel, uh, a long liner or a purse seiner or um, one of those. Um, or closer to shore, you get trawlers as well. Um, you can see there is, a, I know Katia wants me to talk about hope, and those big circles that you can see in the middle, that's Ascension Island, then St. Helena and Tristan da Cunha. And those have, um, in the last five years, been protected in this incredibly effective way, as you can see by the fact that there are no vessels going in there. So it is possible to protect large tract tracts of the ocean. But generally, we need much better governance of our oceans. Um, currently, only 8.2% of the ocean is protected and only 2.9% highly protected. Um, but we've had a couple of big international policy breakthroughs in the last year. First of all, uh, Montreal in December last year, uh, the coming Montreal Agreement to protect 30% of land and sea by 2030 is uh, thrilling. It has to be actually implemented, but it's a good starting point. And then uh, in March, the High Seas Treaty, um, meaning that we could start to protect areas in beyond national jurisdiction in the middle of the ocean uh, where you, you just saw in that chart. Um, but we need, uh, basically, we need to find a way of getting from that 8.2 figure to 30% uh, in short order by 2030. This is the decade of ocean protection, and we haven't moved fast enough so far in the first three years of it. Um, but also... Currently, only mangrove, seagrass, and salt marsh are recognized by the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, um, whereas there's far more in uh, other types of, um, of, of carbon-absorbing habitats and other mechanisms, as I was saying, that uh, need to be protected. And also, just recognizing those key habitats doesn't mean that they're protected. So a lot more needs to happen in policy. This is um, a photo from the largest continuous kelp forest on Earth. It's in Patagonia. And it's just one example of a, a blue carbon habitat that is not recognized or protected in any sort of framework. Um, and like a lot of blue carbon habitats, it doesn't just absorb carbon. It plays a whole range of extraordinary roles from uh, providing a buffer against storm damage, uh, coastal erosion. Uh, it's a breeding ground for 
fish. It's a, an amazing habitat. And we don't know, scientists don't know exactly how much carbon it, it absorbs. Um, so uh, I would suggest that the precautionary principle is a good idea, but currently we are uh, generally kind of ripping up kelp beds, so not sensible. And the final area which we need to focus on is economics, because um, as you can see from this slide, there's a massive gap in terms of how much is currently going into ocean protection and how much we need to put into ocean protection. So there's a big funding gap. And the problem is that until now, and this isn't just a problem with the ocean, there's a problem in nature as a whole, that as capitalism has developed over the last couple of millennia, um, it's developed on the lines of an exploitative model. So uh, we basically kind of value nature in order to eat it, burn it, build on it, build with it, a few other things. But uh, generally, you kind of destroy nature um, and, uh, and only pay for those services under that context. Um, instead, what we need to do is place a value on uh, nature intact, performing its vital uh, services for us. So in order to do that, we need to find a way of, of valuing protection. Uh, and there are many financial mechanisms, which uh, some of us are going to touch on a bit later, that can potentially work to actually support models of protection. And finally, we need to change the way that the global economy currently um, basically pays for the exploitation of marine life through perverse subsidies. We are paying many billions of, of dollars to the fishing industry worldwide to overfish, to fish using damaging methods. And that clearly is a disaster and needs to be changed immediately. Um, so at this point, I'm going to hand over to Katia. Yes, thank you so much, Claire. I mean, you, you, this, this we can actually spend hours debating because this is a very, first of all, important, of course, issue. And, but all these key factors that you mentioned, which are vital for the discussion, which are the economics, the policy making, uh, and we're also raising awareness. Um, but we cannot move forward without the cooperation of governments. So we have, like, like we just mentioned, COP28 is just a few, few weeks away. And this year, it is expected that ocean-based solutions to climate change will receive greater recognition. They will, you know, it will feature, have a, play a significant role in the debate. Let's hope so. <laughs> so with that in mind, I would love to go back to all of you, perhaps Puninda could start, with your thoughts, what would you like to see agreed upon at COP28? What is the most urgent pressing issue that you would like to see debated and agreed? Not an easy first question to tackle, um, but thanks so much for, first of all, having me and very grateful to be joined by everyone else on, on this panel. Um, before I answer that question, I'll just level set to describe a little bit about the role of the Climate Champions team. Um, so the role of high-level Climate Champions was created under the Paris Agreement uh, in 2015, um, mainly just to connect the role and the, um, the policies uh, and positioning of parties with, with the role of non-state actors. Um, so cities, regions, businesses, and financial institutions with the theory of change that there is an ambition loop that can be activated so that when governments see that there is already action happening by leaders in the market space, then they can hopefully put in place the right enabling environment from a policy perspective to make that shift happen. Um, so the high-level climate champions, um, these are appointed roles from the presidency. And so currently the two high-level climate champions are Dr. Mahmoud Mohideen for COP27 and Her Excellency Razan Al-Bubarak for COP28. And the climate champions team um, is a, a team, a global team that supports 
them and their priorities. Um, and our goal is really to rally other non-state actors. So the work that we do is through partners, um, including um, the ones that I'm sitting with here um, and other organizations globally to show up at COP uh, with the right market signals to, to ensure that we're moving the needle in the right direction to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. Um, so to answer your question around, you know, what do we need to see at COP this year, um, it is a critical year because it's also the year of the global stock take. And uh, what the global stock take means um, is that this year the parties uh, will be taking stock of how far off we are in meeting the goals of the Paris Agreement, and we know that the results are not going to be great. And so we need to be very clear about what the outputs to the global stock take are so that the global community has a clear path on the way forward. And to your point, uh, hoping to position ocean uh, climate solutions as a, as a key path forward on what we need to see. And part of that, uh, Claire, you touched on the importance of policy and sustainable ocean plans are a key enabling policy lever that countries can put in place to create the right conditions to protect and conserve, uh, protect and, uh, and conserve uh, ocean habitats. And that's something that we're hoping to see now that we also have the Kunming Montreal um, Global Biodiversity Framework in place. So how do we ensure that there are synergies between the Paris Agreement and the Global Biodiversity Framework within countries and enhance the, the synergies between the nationally determined contribution targets that countries come up have to come up with on their emissions, as well as the national biodiversity action plans that they have to come up on the biodiversity side. So from a policy perspective, really important to see those synergies as well uh, to be advancing um, within you know, the UNFCCC process, but also the convention of bio biological diversity as well. So um, yeah, that was a long-winded answer, but I think the policy side is, is what we really need to, to see um, step up to create the right conditions. What about you, Tom? What do you want to say? My hopes for COP. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to speak. Um, I think Beninda's right that the, the global stock take is a, is a critical moment. Uh, sadly, we can, uh, we can premeditate what we're going to hear, and actually its significance is as much for the trajectory going forward as what we've, we've seen to date. So I think my hope is also that ocean-based solutions, that the growing interest across sectors continues to grow. Um, but that lands as uh, credible, evidence-based, sustainably financed commitments by countries that are seen as a complementary strand of action, not a substitute for emissions reductions more broadly. Claire, would you like to add? To Tom just took my answer. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to. I'd like to see the ocean recognised um, for its kind of crucial role, and therefore uh, get better protection. But exactly as Tom and I were agreeing earlier, that that isn't um, a substitute for the kind of drastic and urgent emissions reduction that we need. Um, and I think I think there's a danger that the ocean, as as usual, is seen as kind of you know a dumping ground. It'll it'll absorb all our pollution. It'll absorb all our waste. And the ocean is full now. So uh, we need we need to kind of do both, reduce emissions and start to look after the ocean properly. And so if this can somehow be you know, embodied in policies at, at COP, that would be great. Um, and just as, as a sort of another issue <laughs> of crazy things that we're doing to our planet, we're, we're also happy as a team at Blue Marine to uh, get more countries to uh, join the moratorium on deep sea mining, which is the sort of latest madness. It's a key thing. I mean, we all know that oceans play a vital role in stabilizing the climate, but again, to see actions, uh, it's very important, isn't it, to see people actually moving forward with actions and results. And, and Thomas, I would like to um, actually bring you to the conversation with something that you, you work, the work have, you have been developing at Pew. Um, you have extensive experience, I mean, all of you have, uh, working with multiple stakeholders. And your work specifically at Pew has brought blue carbon coastal wetlands to the forefront of discussion around marine uh, nature-based solutions. 
And so could you tell us a little bit more about blue carbon wetlands and their importance? And of course, also, if you could perhaps illustrate with uh, initiative where collaboration among stakeholders produced, uh, brought about positive change. Sure. I will turn around sporadically. Um, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to speak briefly, not a quality I'm famous for, I confess, but uh, about the work that Pew does in this sector. Uh, my name is Tom Hickey. I work for the Pew Charitable Trusts. That's a US-based conservation organization. Uh, but with offices all over the world, based just south of London. And I'm the project director on our Coastal Wetlands and Coral Reefs project. So what is that? Um, we work to support countries that have a pretty specific ambition. So that is to protect or restore their coastal wetlands, those mangroves, seagrasses, and salt marshes that Claire alluded to, as a component of their nationally determined contributions to the Paris Agreement. Why do we do that? Well. Again, as sort of Claire teed up, these are also known as blue carbon ecosystems. Um, and the distinction I guess I would offer to this room is that blue carbon is frequently applied to a whole range of species and habitats, an increasing number, uh, and their function within the global biology, uh, excuse me, carbon pump. But actually, the amount by which uh, we can remove carbon from that cycle is currently limited, or the measurable amount, I should say, is currently limited to these three ecosystems. So, there is IPCC guidance out there which allows countries to account for either the rate of admissions uh, being produced by the degradation of these ecosystems or the potential benefits through conservation and restoration. So that means if you're thinking about entry into climate policy, that's a very powerful, that's a, that's a necessary component of your climate commitments, right? So like any other sector, if you wish to protect or restore, you can account for those benefits and include them in your mitigation commitments. But they also provide a whole load of other benefits in helping us adapt and become more resilient to climate change. They buffer shorelines from increasing the erratic weather patterns. They stabilize shorelines. You get incredible wave attenuation properties from seagrasses. So they can help us mitigate, adapt, and become more resilient to climate change. And they have a whole ton of critical ecosystem services, filtering our water, providing intrinsic benefits to, to a whole range of different countries. Uh, and a globally significant biodiversity hotspot. So if you were to create a template for what a nature-based solution can potentially offer, these are your, these are your ecosystems. So, so for Pew, this is an approach where we hope we can demonstrate not just the power of wetlands, but actually what does it take to put nature-based solutions into practice? Um, you cannot throw a stick at COP without hitting some discussion about nature-based solutions, but they're often still pretty abstract. Uh, what does it mean practically to take these forward? And that is, that is our goal. How do we do that? Well, uh, to the Brits in the room, that does what it says on the tin, they are nationally determined contributions. What it means to protect and restore seagrasses in Tanzania is very different to what it means in Mozambique. But we try to adopt a, an approach that is, is grounded in a couple of key uh, tenets. So first and foremost, we want to give countries the support they need to implement these commitments over time. We want to strengthen the capacities. Very often the capacity is there. It doesn't need developing, it needs strengthening. So we design research, policy, outreach programs to specifically support their countries in that pursuit. Uh, the approach is absolutely not limited to blue carbon. That is, that is probably Pew's uh, point of difference in this sector compared to perhaps others, is, is that we really try to look at these as blue carbon ecosystems and the support we offer is reflected in that. Um, it is absolutely focused on, on strengthening capacity and most importantly, it's done in partnership. So Pew is a partner, we're not a donor. My bosses are watching. We are not a donor. Um, we have brilliant research, financing, um, uh, policy expertise. Uh, but in the countries where we're currently working, which is Costa Rica, Belize, uh, Panama, Honduras, and Jamaica, Seychelles, Kenya, Tanzania, and Mozambique, we don't have any offices. We don't have any permanent presence. We don't have any, frankly, local knowledge that would surpass uh, the understanding and appreciation of what those local partners do. So we design and we execute these partnerships in partnership. What does that look like? Um, so from 2019 to 2022, we had, uh, I can best describe it as a proof of concept phase. Prior to the 2020 update of NDCs, and NDCs are updated every five years, although a country can do that whenever they wish, prior to the 2020 update, huge amounts of recognition of the potential of these ecosystems. Right? So they have a huge amount that they can offer to, to mitigation, adaptation, and resilience, but very, very few measurable, specific targets towards achieving that potential. So we worked in three countries, uh, albeit remotely, through a lot of COVID, Costa Rica, Belize, and Seychelles. 
Uh, and forgive the text heavy slide there, but there's just a brief summary of the type of commitments that were made, the partnerships that we've worked in. So roll forward to, to March 2022, the Pew team are feeling very proud, very smug to some degree with our achievement. And I'm sure like a lot of you, we have internal strategic reviews where everyone offers their two cents. And um, one of, I think, the most striking observations we got was this is a wonderful sample, but it's a very small sample, right? So you've proved your concept. How do you make that now more robust, more extensive, more representative? So we're now in a second phase of work running from 2022 to at least the end of 26, probably 28, where we have three main goals. We want to implement the commitments we've already helped support uh, in Costa Rica, Belize, and Seychelles. Our, our model, our goal doesn't stand up if we don't see that impact on the ground. Secondly, we are expanding in two regions. So where we're currently operating in Latin America, Caribbean, and the Western Indian Ocean, uh, of course, there is an awful lot of blue carbon work out with for those regions, but that's where we currently operate at the moment. We're expanding that support to the next cycle of NDCs in 2025. So Panama, Honduras, Jamaica, in Latin America, Caribbean, and Kenya, Tanzania, and Mozambique. And thirdly, and finally, we seek to look at this regional approach, which is a sort of shuddering buzzword sometimes. Like, what do we mean by a regional approach? Um, the hard truth is that we don't have time to do this one country at a time. Like, we need to see exponential scaling of ambition. We cannot just do this in a linear way. NDCs are always nationally determined, but there are some consistent uh, threads across country requests, baseline habitat research, technical support for inclusion of blue carbon in inventories, financing, outreach. So how is it possible to look at regional frameworks to help complement and scale those individual country ambitions? Um, I was invited to speak very briefly about one of the projects. I could talk all day about any of them, so I'm going to be brief as I can. What did we do in Seychelles? Um, when we first started work in Seychelles, we had a, a very interested, very supportive government. Um, Seychelles is an archipelago of 115 islands. It has a, a pretty small land mass, actually, and therefore a, a pretty small mangrove extent. Uh, but across the 1.3 million kilometers of ocean, there was a feeling that they had an awful lot of seagrass. So uh, we worked with the government to map that compared to, to, to mangroves and salt marshes. Seagrasses are underwater most of the time. Cloud cover, water turbidity is, is challenging. So we worked with the University of Oxford, the German Aerospace Agency, to create a remote sensed map. Um, that map was great, but it wasn't really of much use to anyone until you ground truth it. And the usefulness of the ground truthing wasn't just to confirm the presence of those ecosystems, it was actually an approach to get that buy-in, to get that understanding from local communities. So we had a very technical research output complemented by policy engagement, but through that, we did a whole ton of work with our partners, uh, with local communities, fishing communities, schools. There are two buses driving around the main island in Seychelles Mahe with the Coastal Wetlands and Coral Reefs Project banner on it, which stimulates all sorts of conversation. And I guess most interestingly, from our perspective, um, when we, we were doing some of this outreach with our partners, there is no word for seagrass in Seychelles Creole. So we actually worked with the Institute of Seychelles Creole to designate words. So, uh, it was originally known as uh, Gomon, which means algae, and now it's referred to as Gomon Zerb, Zerb la mer. So you had that, uh, we hope, a really interesting case study in how you take that local engagement through to national policy making. And now, uh, very excitingly, sometimes scarily, um, we're seeing that scale regionally. Um, so on the back of the work in Seychelles, we are now embarking on that same seagrass mapping approach uh, across the whole Western Indian Ocean. So this is a photo of a workshop everyone loves a photo of a workshop, I'm sure, uh, that we held in Nairobi a few weeks ago at the Africa Climate Week. And this is a group of people that are going to take forward that mapping effort. Um, and crucially, individual country partners are there, IUCN's there, PEW's there, et cetera, et cetera. But the driving force for this project is the Western Indian Ocean Marine Science Association. It sounds like a mouthful, but it's really important. It's the regional network of, of marine scientists in the Western Indian Ocean and the Nairobi Convention which is the 12 countries that, that, that um, reside in the West Indian Ocean. So those regional frameworks, we hope, are that opportunity to try and drive scale um, exponentially and not just uh, in a linear way. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you so much. I mean, it's so great to see uh, projects like this. And Puninda, you have also um, great experience in trying to bring the private sector, for instance, and to actually getting uh, finance to direct finance to uh, nature-based solutions. So could you tell us a little bit more about your uh, work and your experience in bringing investments to the solutions? And if you could perhaps also illustrate with a case study. 
Sounds good. I'm going to pick up on what Tom mentioned, which is that we need ex we need to see exponential scale of ambition, and that's exactly what we're hoping to uh, really rally around as as climate champions and hoping to, you know work collaboratively with other organizations to, to bring forth. So what you see on the screen here are the ocean breakthroughs, uh, which we launched with the various partners um, last month. And these are essentially transformative pathways covering a few different ocean sectors, laying out 20, 30 goals of where we need to be. And having a North Star of science-backed measurable goals of where we need to be by 2030 can help rally around non-state actors, businesses, private financial institutions, and uh, cities and regions and, and others to, to figure out, okay, if by, if by 2030 we need on marine conservation to, and I can't see this properly, by 2030 investments of at least 72 billion to secure the integrity of ocean ecosystems. Um, so knowing that for private financial institutions and the role that they can play to mobilize capital towards the contribution to that 72 billion is quite important. I won't go through you know, the marine conservation, aquatic food and shipping and ocean renewable energy goals that are outlined on the screen behind me, uh, but this is exactly the kind of output that we hope to see from COP28 is having that direction on the way forward uh, as to what we need to, to see sectorally happen and the role that businesses working across these different sectors can then focus on, you know, putting in place nature positive business models um, to, to redirect capital flows. Um, the other initiative that I'll briefly mention is the mangrove breakthrough. So similarly on the, the mangrove side, and Claire spoke about the, the power of mangroves, um, which can sequester up to 43.5 million um, uh, you know, tons of uh, carbon emissions. Um, so they're quite, quite powerful. And uh, the science-backed uh, science kind of goal uh, and finance goal that, uh, that has, been, um, has been put out there is that we need to mobilize $4 billion by 2030 towards the protection and restoration and conservation of mangroves globally. And so how do we then reorient the, the private finance sector as well as businesses to, to be able to contribute to that? Um, this was something that was launched at COP27 last year. And uh, this year, we've uh, worked with various partners to uh, put forth uh, a, an upcoming mangrove financing roadmap, which lays out the state of play of you know, where we are, are currently at when it comes to directing flows towards uh, this $4 billion goal, and what are the types of business models and uh, financial instruments that are currently working, what needs to be scaled, and to Tom's point earlier, much of these barriers and opportunities are regional. You know, It gets into things like marine spatial planning and um, zoning laws and whatnot, so uh, having a consideration of what are those enabling, enabling conditions that we need to see um, across different regions and countries to, to ensure that there is that redirection of capital flows around um, mangrove protection and restoration is, is important. And we worked with uh, quite a few financial uh, institutions, including insurers and uh, banks, to, to get their perspective on what would make um, a, na a nature-based solution project bankable, knowing that we're very much in early stages of uh, um, you know, making some of these projects uh, be attractive to commercial capital. So we really do need to see uh, different types of uh, capital flows from concessional capital, from philanthropic capital, um, and partnerships um, between you know, phil phil philanthropy and private sector uh, to, to really be scaled uh, in order to redirect some of these capital flows. The last thing I'll briefly mention is uh, launch this mobilizing private capital for uh, nature um, report at New York Climate Week uh, this September. And this really puts out some of the key case studies, um, including a focus on mangroves and coral reefs, uh, but also other nature-based solutions, uh, regenerative agriculture and uh, land restoration efforts. And uh, really puts forth the case of, you know, what are the innovative financial instruments that are working, 
what are the case, um, the financial um, case that uh, companies are seeing in terms of contributing to those efforts, and the importance of multi-stakeholder catalytic initiatives um, that can that can really help uh, accelerate some of these efforts. So I'll end on on that particular note. Thank you so much. Um, I, what I what I love about this discussion is that we can see results. People who are making a difference are working together to create solutions. And I know the Blue Marine Foundation uh, does also an incredible job in bringing people together, bringing stakeholders. So Claire, also if you could illustrate uh, a few examples of how uh, the Blue Marine Foundation is leading the way in implementing sustainable solutions and ensuring marine protections, she would need that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Katia. Well, um, Blue Marine was kind of born out of a film, and so we're, we're very interested in trying to raise awareness in kind of new and original ways that will draw people in to understanding complicated things like how the ocean actually absorbs carbon, what all the different mechanisms are. So we've created this kind of uh, virtual reality experience that so far I think has reached over one and a half million people worldwide. We're translating it into, um, I think we've seven languages so far, but you know, uh, more every month as it were. And it's just part of our effort to raise awareness about the, um, both the crisis in the ocean and the fact that there are amazing nature-based solutions that um, are there to be explored, including for people who haven't got access to you know, going underwater, diving, and things like that. So that's one thing that we're doing. It's called the Sea We Breathe. If people are interested, it's on the Blue Marine website. Um, the other thing, well, one of many other things that we're doing is back to this question about trying to understand how much uh, carbon is actually in the ocean and where and through what mechanism and so on. And so we've entered into a partnership with um, Exeter University and with Convex, which is an insurance company. The insurance industry has understood the threats of climate change probably better than most industries over the decades. And so this is a multi-million project to try and answer the kind of key question, which is how uh, does the, the ocean absorb carbon exactly and how much is down there, particularly on the seabed um, in the coastal shelves. And um, it, it's kind of a whole presentation in its own right and I won't sort of murder it by trying to talk about things that I, I certainly don't understand. But um, the scientists are trying to uh, work this out through a series of, of, of work streams, but I just wanted to end with this um, slide that I thought was incredibly beautiful of, um, this is the sort of creatures that live on the ocean floor. Um, and they're called things like crinoids and squirts and sea stars and bryzoans and sponges. And they all play a different but you know, slightly unique role in uh, taking carbon. They sort of filter carbon out of the water and then bring it down and lock it into sediment on the ocean floor. And um, very little is understood about them. We've, we're, we're trying to model them in, in kind of tanks in, up in Scotland and work out what on earth they do and how they do it. It was kind of like worms in the garden, only more interesting. Um, but the, the crucial thing is that uh, they're, they're just not in evidence where there's disturbance of the seabed. So again, you know, kind of not taking the precautionary principle. We're uh, trawling all over the place, particularly in uh, marine protected areas in Britain. And, um, and we uh, at, haven't really understood the role of the seabed or the ocean floor. In, in mitigating climate change. So we're trying to change that at Plymouth. That's so important, isn't it? Because uh, we all know, I mean, we love going to the beach, we love, we love you know, we know the value of the oceans. But I, you were trying to bring the solutions uh, and also the discussion and with these elements that you just described so people can actually 
see themselves in a situation like see these beautiful creatures, how the, uh, you know, the, the science behind it. All those elements are very important. But sometimes also this discussion can be a little bit daunting to the regular person who's walking, you know, like me, for instance. Like you see, there is, a, of course, the scientific debate, the policy making that we just discussed, the economic side as well. Um, I would like to ask all of you, uh, what would be your advice for people who are, might be watching this as well online and who want to contribute, they want to make a difference, but they don't even know how to start, even if it's a small step, what could you tell everyone who's watching and who's here tonight with us and what they can do to help uh, protect the ocean's marine life, make a difference? Who would like to start? <laughs> I'll have a go. Um, I would probably say just be heard. I, I think whether you're exercising, you're, you're heard as a, a consumer economically, whether you're heard politically as a voter, be heard, but also think about how you're heard now. You know, this room is full and uh, pretty much, uh, and I say this in the most positive way, a lot of the rooms that we work in now are full. This is not a marginal peripheral discussion in political context, in private sector context. And accordingly, it doesn't have to be just a green issue when you're heard. So absolutely, if you care about the ocean because you think whales and turtles and other charismatic megafauna are awesome, make sure that's heard. If you are like me, uh, if you like fishing and catching pollock and you hope that one day your kids will catch pollock and enjoy eating them, make sure that's heard as well. Because I think the challenge we have now is uh, we have very, very full rooms, we have very, very captive audiences, but what is the message they take away? And, and my hope is that the message isn't just that this is a green issue. This is absolutely integral to, to people's lives, to people's livelihoods, to the planet. So don't just be heard, think about how you want to be heard. Would you like to say, Benita? I think you covered it all. Um, but I think what I'll add to that is, I always come back to the fact that we just need to reevaluate our relationship with nature more broadly. And I think that very much centers around how do we transform this broader economic system. And to your point, what are those small steps that we can take in our lives as consumers, as citizens, to, to move the needle in the right direction? Um, I think thinking day to day consciously about the choices that, that you're making while also noting that these are systems level issues that we're, we're grappling with. So not letting individual action be a barrier to having a system-wide critique of the, of the issue that, that we're facing uh, while being conscious of the individual choices we're making um, is, is what I'll add to, to what you've said. Yeah, and I'd add that um, I think we have much more political capital than we realize we do, particularly around, I, I mean, the ocean is arguably, the, and, and climate is the biggest issue facing us. And yet in, in the context of politicians and the next election, it's seen as niche, um, which is bad, obviously. But the good news about that is that um, politicians are much more up for, you know, kind of interventions and uh, making a difference at, at kind of government policy level than perhaps we realize. And we, we had a rather kind of exciting moment on the Blue Marine team uh, a couple of weeks ago when uh, the UK government announced a U-turn on deep sea mining and supported a moratorium having uh, previously been anti it. And I think that was because they felt the pressure from people contacting their MPs who in turn put pressure on the government who when I, or I will have to do something that isn't completely crap. So, um, so they um, so, so they announced this uh, U-turn, and I'd quite like to just embarrass a couple of my team members, mates, to Adrian and Ashling. If you could possibly stand up, um, this is this <laughs> this is <laughs> yeah they they did it, um, but also. If um, you're interested in getting your voice heard with your MP, contact uh, or speak to these two straight after this. And they've got some good ideas of things that you can kind of currently press on 
that are maybe going to make a big change. So, uh, you know, letters, you can write tweets, you can tweet or whatever to your MP to get actual policy change, which is fun and exciting and uh, better than kind of lying under the duvet thinking that the world's about to end. I just want to briefly add to, to Claire's point. I think many of these problems can seem overwhelming, but approaching it from what can I, what is my entry point, what can I bring to this? So if you're an artist, you know, drawing and um, whatever your artistic choice is, um, using that as a platform to, to make noise, or if you're politically engaged, you know, writing letters and the rest and the advocacy side, um, and if you're working in the finance sector, putting nature on the agenda in the boardroom and, and trying to convince your peers to, to do that. So I think we all have different roles that we can play in the different uh, spaces that we navigate, and so seeing what your entry point is always, always really helpful. That's really a good advice. Um, and I think one last thing that I would like to ask you, I mean, we have a few minutes left uh, before, I think I'm sure people from the audience want to ask questions as well. Um, it's very easy for us to feel disheartened, like I mentioned in my introduction, we open the newspapers and we see the news uh, and we lose hope. And particularly also with the environment, I think there's a lot of people who are not feeling that things are moving as fast as they need. And we have, I know that we have students in the audience as well, and I'm always very, uh, I think One Million Voices always wants to raise awareness of people like you who have been making a difference, but also we want to perhaps, um, you know, like I said, share a, a spirit of hope to people. So if you have a message of hope you would like to share, particularly with the younger generation, who may be feeling very disheartened at the moment, what would you say to them? I uh, go back to this quote from uh, a prison abolitionist um, activist uh, based in the States. And she says, hope is a discipline. And it's a practice that, that we have, that we need to consciously build. And so I, I think that's something that, that really resonates with, with me. And I think in climate action, um, young people um, get frustrated um, when we say that hope is with the younger generation, um, and rightfully so. I think hope is within intergenerational collaboration um, and noting that we have a lot to learn from each other, but also hope is in challenging power dynamics in every space that we navigate. So that's something that, that I um, try to attempt to live with. Um, I, I would actually look around the room here. Um, Claire alluded to the fact that Blue was founded on a, a film, but it was actually prior to that found on the book. Uh, and I remember being a student reading that book and thinking, this is, this is awesome. This is, this is what I want to do. This is terrifying, but this is what I want to do. Um, and then finding there weren't that many other people looking at it. Um, there are some faces in the room who were there. But I think the fact that we have things like a blue belt now, I mean, that was just a pipe dream three or four, five years ago, talking about the potential for the, all of the UK's overseas territories to be uh, contributory to that broader uh, global conservation effort. There's, amongst the blue carbon sort of community, there's this famous event that, in Cancun at COP19, uh, COP16, excuse me, where they had the first blue carbon side event. Um, and there were more panellists than audience. Um, there's dozens of events, this, this COP. Now, that's not necessarily an end in its own right. It's actually something we need to be very, very careful with because there's, there's risks and opportunities there. But I guess my message, like hope, is that, that we are seeing uh, an exponential interest. We need to see that continue to be exponential interest. But um, we've got a pretty solid foundation at this point. Yeah, I'm, I'm made very ho hopeful by seeing the work that you're both doing. I think it's amazing um, what Beninda and Tom are up to in their organizations. And I think in, I guess the thing that gives me hope, it, it's more a, a, just a sort of gritted determination that it's really important not to give up, to keep doing what you can do within the scope of your own job. Um, I find it baffling that people would not work within the environmental sector 
uh, given all that we know. So, um, you know, devote as much of your life as you can to doing what you can do. And I think, you know, and, and then occasionally you get these kind of breakthrough moments which are very thrilling and very rewarding. So we just need more of them faster, sooner. If I could ask quickly just a few rapid fire questions, just for fun. And you just mentioned this moment that was uh, special to you. If you could um, no, tell us about the most rewarding moments in your professional lives. I know that probably there are more than one, but one that was, wow. Maybe <laughs> not an easy question. The, the one that, um, it's not ocean related, which is why it's uh, deforestation related, uh, but something we, it was a collective effort that we worked on this year was to mainstream guidance on deforestation action across different finance networks, including CDP, um, IIGCC, and uh, series. And that's something that, that I thought was quite impactful to, to note that we, we know that we need to halt and reverse deforestation by 2030 to meet our climate goals. And yet we know that the finance, finance sector is really lagging on this. So how can we really rally the finance networks to, to focus on this issue and provide clear guidance on what they need to do to make deforestation as a key part of their net zero goals. So I was very happy when we were able to, to put that, uh, that collective guidance out and, and have the support of these finance networks this year to, to really elevate the importance of this issue. Professionally, uh, actually probably that last photo I had on the slide to see that sort of interaction and um, actually not have, not have an awful lot to do with it, actually just to see that panning out as a consequence of some of the things that, that our team had done was, was pretty cool. Yeah, we, we've had a few uh, in the last couple of weeks. There was the deep sea mining U-turn and there was getting almost 30% of Jersey's waters protected and um, the St. Vincent and the Grenadines uh, agreement to have um, all the closed seasons we recommended in their water. So that was just in the last two weeks. But I think overall, um, the most thrilling moment where I sort of cried for happiness was when we managed to get ascension protected. So an area nearly the size of France in the middle of the Atlantic completely closed to fishing when it had been, uh, you know, kind of ravaged by long liners um, with, with lines up to 100 uh, kilometers long, taking all sorts of extraordinary life. And, and being able to see that on that slide kind of uh, from, you know, an area that you can see quite clearly from space um, was, continues to be pretty, pretty good moment. Another quick question. What is your favorite spot by the sea where you feel deep appreciation for what the oceans give back to us? I can do that one. That's easy. There is a lighthouse uh, on the eastern edge of Polperro Harbour um, that looks out due west. Uh, it's wicked. Can you invite everyone to visit? I, th I thought you said sport by the sea, so I was trying to think what I could do. <laughs> um, I, I have a particularly favourite spot in... Greece, which is a kind of beautiful bay where I go every summer, rather predictably, and uh, I just I just love it to bits. The way the sea is always changing colour, you know, as you look at it. Um, so that's my happy place. Mine is in Vancouver, Canada. Um, I'm originally from Toronto, but I'll pick Vancouver um, because it's close to the ocean and it's just absolutely stunning. Uh, you can just hear the waves crashing and, uh, and the meditative, I think, feeling that you get when you're by the ocean is, is absolutely stunning. Another fun question. Do you have a favorite marine species? If yes, which one and why? I'm a big fan of biomimicry, um, so manta rays are what come to mind with the filtering power that they have and how that's been used to 
um, yeah, inspire other things that, that we create using filtration. So, um, and they're also beautiful. Uh, probably what we in the UK call a monkfish, but I think others call anglerfish. Um, worked on a netting boat over the years, uh, catching monkfish. And um, they're, a, they're a cool species in their own right, but a lot of, lot of memories from that. I like um, octopuses, and um, we, my colleagues will know, we've kind of shaped our organisation like an octopus <laughs> with eight tentacles, including one on, uh, that does blue carbon. Um, but I just think they're completely amazing. I love that. Last question. <laughs> I promise the last one. When I say the word hope, what, what comes to your mind? First thing. Action. Probably that Barack Obama poster, to be honest. But <laughs> I think everyone in this room. Oh, that's great. Thank you so, so much to all of you. This has been absolutely brilliant. And I'm sure that we still have a few minutes for questions. Not as many questions, probably. But we're going to stay afterwards. So do <laughs> join us for drinks. You can meet all our panelists here. So should we go? I think she raised the first. <laughs> and then that gentleman behind her. And then I'm going. Hi, thank you. Um, I've actually got four questions. I'll throw them out, and you'll see which ones you want to answer. So first of all, I just want to say, in terms of hope, there are people like me who you don't know that follow your work, and you are inspiring people all the time whose names you don't know. And I also, because I follow you, know how hard it can be at times. So I want to say we see you, we thank you, love what you're doing. To the questions. COP, it's going to be really important, this COP, the whole idea of this just an equitable transition, how are we going to do it? Given that we have Pew in the room, I just want to do a shout out to the Nature for Debt Blue Galapagos uh, bomb that came out. Um, you should brag about that a lot more, by the way, because people haven't understood the power of you know, getting these MPAs that we need that are true, um, not just paper parks, while you are alleviating poverty, that's a win-win solution. You've got finance in there. It's a beautiful story that people stay away from because it's too technical. Anyway, I digress. My question was, given that the incoming president on the 1st of December in Ecuador isn't as interested in these mechanisms, is there a way we can encourage him to think this is really cool, um, one? And two, is Pew now going to look at other areas where you can do this? Because, Or do you feel that this maybe has gone mainstream enough because it's been proven in the private sector that it works? and therefore there isn't a role. First question. Second question, on MPAs, is there any way, Claire, that we can flip the entire conversation? Actually, the question is, how impossible is it to flip it such that it's not, because the 30-30 is too hard, if I get the feeling. Is there a way that we can flip it such that everything is a marine protected area around the globe, and you need to apply for permits? So rather than applying to become an MPA or a highly protected MPA, can we just flip the entire narrative, everything from now on. And if you want to mine, if you want to fish, if you want to, obviously industrial scale, I mean, you need to ask for permits. Is there a way to, to do that? Three, specifically, you mentioned the kelp forest, Patagonia, and so exciting that there's a, a minister of environment that's exciting to, to do this. Um, but what about the salmon fisheries? Like, how is that aquaculture going to work? And how hard is it going to be for her to get things through? And fourth, on deep sea mining, given that we're in London, how can we get the economist, you know, now that it's taken its stance for deep sea mining, to turn that around, or does it not matter, or is it hopeless? We, we only have a few minutes, <laughs> and I'm sure there are other people who also want to. So I don't work on Ecuador, so I'm not going to butcher my <laughs> colleagues' work. I will say that um, governments change, and actually if you look at really durable conservation schemes, like even the Blue Belt in the UK, they're founded on a lot more, there's a lot more depth, right? There's a lot more political engagement cross party. There's a lot more uh, investment longer term. There's a lot more awareness across stakeholder groups. So of course, politicians change. But I'd like to think, and I, my colleagues will correct me, that there is sufficient depth within that particular program to, to clap. Oh, and in, yes, it's something we are looking at. It's not something we're actively working at, but um, sure, that, like a lot of people, we're looking at depth and nature swaps as a possibility.
I can, sorry, just add to, add to that. I agree that we need to be talking a lot more about these solutions that are working. And just to plug, the Galapagos um, Dead for Nature deal is included in the report that I shared as a case study showing what is the role of the different types of actors that are involved in the transaction and what is the case for them to, to be part of this. We need to be seeing, seeing more of these instruments being scaled. And uh, MDBs and DFIs also play a key role in credit enhancement um, that, that they can provide to, to further enable other actors to be involved. Banks are keen. Um, other conservation organizations and the rest are keen. And we need to be, if we, if we do need to mobilize climate finance, uh, we need to ensure it's tied to the development agenda in a clear way. So fully agree with that. So on the question, very interesting question about 30 by 30 and whether we kind of flip it round. I mean, for starters, I think we can't just look at protection and then say the rest of it can be just, you know, fished out. We've got to have the entire ocean managed. So, you know, at least 30% protection, but then the rest sustainably managed. And I think a lot of that comes down to economic incentives, which are currently completely, you know, upside down and perverse, uh, both on the kind of high seas and within national jurisdictions. So we have to kind of have a different economic framework around how we exploit the ocean. Subsidies need to end now. And then, uh, it, yes, uh, through a, a combination of kind of permits and kind of better controlled laws of the sea so that you can only kind of use the ocean in, in particular ways, that would, be, that would be the dream. And then, in a sense, related around deep sea mining, I think where The Economist has, has kind of gone wrong, as, as I see it, is that in the quest for net zero, that there's the assumption that we need a lot of rare earths to power electric vehicles and um, renewable energy. I think, I think that's a false premise, and that if we were able to kind of open up that debate to show that, in fact, solid state technologies using, for example, sodium rather than lithium, et cetera, et cetera, could uh, fuel the the kind of quest for net zero so that effectively we're not uh, destroying biodiversity in order to reach our climate targets. The, the two sh must go hand in hand, otherwise we're screwed. I mean, we have time for one very quick question, like one minute question. <laughs> Who has a very quick question? She has raised her hand as well. Very quick yeah. Um, thank you for the talk. It was really, I think I'm, I'm someone who doesn't know a lot about oceans, so I'm just trying to learn a bit more. I work in the private sector. One of the concepts that we've seen really grow in the past and despite the debate is carbon credit markets. And I'm wondering if you in, in each of your organizations are talking about kind of like ocean credits or blue, I guess, blue carbon credits and where that kind of sits within the whole ecosystem of the blue ocean economy. Question. Yeah, we had a bit of a chat about this beforehand and wondered if we should go down this particular route because it's, you know, it's troubling uh, currently the, the development of the voluntary credit market and um, our sort of collective view is that it needs to be overseen very carefully and um, in Blue Marine's kind of view of things, we're very wary of uh, carbon credits generally, including in the sea, uh, the way that they're developing potentially along quite exploitative lines for you know, countries that have big stores of uh, carbon habitats. Um, we are more leaning towards biodiversity credits or kind of stacked credits rather than pure carbon credits as a very short answer. So within the kind of coastal wetlands, Sort of sector, carbon credits are, I think, right, that, that was the entry point for a lot of organisations in this space. There are some good examples uh, of, of schemes that are operating in Kenya and Colombia. Um, but right now, I think the concerns that are being expressed about the voluntary market more broadly, um, which, I mean, they're actually being levelled at terrestrial uh, avoided uh, deforestation. 
um, rather than kind of blue carbon restoration. But but it's a healthy time to be uh, applying that critique because there are some interesting schemes out there at the moment, but if they're to become the, the sort of rule rather than the exception, then there's an awful lot of assurance that people need about the, the durability, the transparency, the permanence of those efforts. And our role is, you know, mostly just to support the creation and uh, an application of highest integrity standards. And so making sure we're bringing the right stakeholders to the table to have these tough conversations on what needs to shift to, to be able to, um, you know, monetize and, and, uh, and redirect capital. So uh, very much on, on the side of how do we ensure that the highest integrity standards are, are put in place to, to regulate these, these markets. Thank you so much. I'm sorry we don't have much time left, <laughs> uh, but if you can stay around, please do come over and speak with our panelists. Uh, I'm sure they will be happy to answer your questions. And thank you so much to all of you who are here today with us. And of course, to Tom, Puninda, and Claire, it's been an honor, a privilege, sorry, uh, to learn from you. And I hope that this has given us 